So, um, Matthias, Matthias Eberius, uh, my line manager actually um, called me one day and he said, Kevin, I got a task for you. I'm assigning you this project called Turfgrass project. Take this data and see what can you make out of it. It was early 2014 uh, and I just got promoted to, to this uh, new position called application scientist. So I was all eager as you could imagine, someone to you know, just jump in into a new um, um, job duties to see how I can apply all the experiences I've got through my PhD and postdoc and, and so forth, how to apply them to answer a specific biological questions with the experience I've gathered in the past. So what follows in the next 20 minutes or so is the story of me, how I tackled this problem. So on day one is the assignment that I got. The data set that I got seriously consists of 40 um, images or so of turf grass samples. Samples have been grown um, in these plastic boxes and um, using a visible camera, top-down images were taken and then, as you see, digitalized in this way. So I thought, okay, let's have a look at these, um, these images. So what can I make out of it? And I thought, it's green. <laughs> it is, it's, it's nicely green and some of them are not green and uh, I, I couldn't get my head around it. I mean, inspiration wasn't really kicking in. And then I thought, besides, what's the deal with, with turf grass? I mean, we have it everywhere. So, um, in other words, inspiration was really was not kicking in at first. A couple of days passed, and on a sunny weekend, let's say, I took my boy um, <coughs> to our garden. And my boy said, Dad, what are we going to do today? I said, well, look at this mess here. It's, um, everything is growing widely, and we need to do some gardening. And I said, well... Let's take the loom more, and then off you go. And he went um, majestically with this mower, as you can see. Um, at the same time, chewing a bubble gum and bursting occasionally. So he looked really fantastic. And, uh, and I thought, wow, um, to me, turf grass or lawn have been a pest because um, I didn't like to do much um, gardening. But for him, it was really fun. And in fact, if I think about it, um, the lawn that had been cut could have been a substitute for sand to play with. And then I was daydreaming as I watched him, how he played, and I thought, well, actually, it was nice. Um, um, occasionally, he climbed on a tree and then fell from the tree a couple of times, and then it was nice to have a soft ground to play with, or to play on it. And then as I was thinking, um, it does actually have some environmental benefit. I mean, um, does absorption, soil erosion, preventing from soil erosion, just to mention a few, not to mention also um, economical impact. So I thought, yeah, my deed does have a cause. So then I turned my head to the left towards my neighbor's garden, and I thought, okay, the grass is not always green on the other side. Um, and I thought, w what's happening there? And his kids were playing there heavily with soccer, and then you can see it's damaging the, 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 um, the turf grass. And I can imagine that the turf grass industry wants to sell their products to, you know, for preventative maintenance, that kind of product. But at the same time, there's also this need to have something more stable, green all the time, robust due to physical stress. Um, it could also be due to weather, hot weather days, and then the grass dries out. So then I thought, yeah, researching that area does make sense. So with a little bit more um, drive, more inspiration, I went back to the office the next day, and I thought, okay, let's have a look at the data again. So now we have first sample, and I thought, right, it's green again. But I have a closer look. The bottom one looks more like darker green, and the other one more lighter green. Is that actually true or not? And then more on the, on the center, you see something more yellowish going on. Is that actually yellow or is it just lighter green? And then I make another observation. With this one, I thought, oh yes, this one here yeah, definitely looks different. You see the dried, aus, dried grass material there. So if I take this image, compare with the first one, I would say it's different. But what about if I have the same um, 
grass, but the dried materials just sprinkle everywhere would have come to the same conclusion or not. I got a lot of questions and I did not have, um, let's say, a method or formula on how to um, come up with a, with, m with a method to analyze it. <coughs> Sorry. So what I did is then I thought, okay, let's take those 40 images and let's classify them manually. And I talk at that time I had an, uh, we had an intern, it's Jurit, and um, we talk about this idea and then I said, okay, you take those data and then you classify them. And um, he came up with four classes, right top would be dried out material, so brownish, and then lower um, bottom on the right is um, green, and on the left side are two different, you know, sort of degrees of, of mixture of, of green and brown and, and how the, the pattern is arranged. And I said, nice, looks nice, you it, but look, my result looks slightly different. And as we started to have a debate about why I, is he classifying in this way and why did I classify in the other way? And then he said, well, this looks green. I said, well, it doesn't. Well, what about this one? I said, well, maybe more. So the story of um, the, the result of, of this little experiment, if you want, was um, we needed to find a method, something more stable, call it normalization if you want, to call what is green and what is not green. Okay, so color was um, an important issue in this analysis here. So, okay, so that was um, that day. On the day after, I thought about color analysis. I used all my experiences um, that I um, gathered at Lambda Tech to my work, and I know digitalized images um, encode colors with the RGB values, okay? So you have red, green, and blue, three different intensities. Any combinations of those will span this color space here, essentially. So you see on the left, do I have a pointer here? On the left bottom, this is purely green, where the green channel is at the maximum, red and blue at the bottom. If you look at this cube, it looks, um, yeah, all the colors are arranged. But it's difficult to, to, to get around it. And then, in fact, there's another model. It's more intuitive. It's called the hue saturation intensity. The nice part of the hue saturation intensity color model is that colors are arranged now in one axis according to our, well, intuition. You have all the rainbows colors now aligned in one axis. What about saturation intensity? Um, if you imagine you have a glass of water and we turn off the light, it becomes darker and darker. Essentially, you're going this direction downwards. You're reducing the intensity. Now, saturation. Imagine you have the glass of water again, so you turn on the lights, obviously, and you dip a little bit um, water color, let's say green. You, you take this little color droplet, put it in a glass of water, and you instantly get this tint of green. You do a little bit more, you get even more. Now it's lighter green, darker green, and then up to the saturated point. So that is saturation, okay? So I thought this model is actually quite nice, but yet how am I going to use it to, to tell how green are my samples? And then, uh, then I did a little bit um, literature research and I found a paper from Crop Science and basically the author introduced um, the concept of dark green color index. And what is dark green color index? It utilizes the hue saturation intensity color model and basically it focuses on uh, colors ranging from yellow to green. Let's pick one color here, one hue value, one yellow value here. And then this color is modulated by saturation and intensity. Now, the formula is essentially a linear combination of those three values, hue, saturation, and intensity. And what it does at the end, it gives you this, I hope you can see it, it gives you this um, um, classification of all those different shades of yellow colors into this, okay? So this yellow with high saturation intensity would be different than uh, this counterpart here. 
And the formula does it not for only yellow, but for another hue value as well. Let's pick another one here, green. And using the same calculation, you get these index values, which are different from this one here. Okay, so essentially, from an image like this, I get an image like that. Okay, once more. Please have a uh, look at, at the left top corner here. The green materials would be converted into something like this. And the lower right bottom dry down material or originally like this is converted to something like that. So I thought now I have a method to, to deal with color and there's no um, ambiguity anymore. The next day is gonna be the longest day. It's gonna be theoretic, but bear with me. So I thought about feature, feature extraction. And what are features? If you think about it, features are basically you're extracting information from the image. And if this information I is going to describe uniquely the property of, of your sample, this is what we call feature. Not all those features are important, but some of them do. So let's do a little bit mind map or, or well brainstorming if you like. So at the center, at the heart of, of what I wanna do is turf grass phenotyping. So there's a turf grass phenotype. I figured out how to convert these colors and then what kind of situation can I have? The first one would be I have only uni colors, so it's simply green or brown or any you know, other colors, not very interesting. What else can happen? I have multiple colors, different nuances of, of you know, differences, essentially. And I thought, oh, well, it's a bit too complex, so let's uh, take something in, in the middle, so a compromise. That would be bi colors, two colors. At that moment, somehow, I don't know why, um, I remembered chemistry. You remember in the past with fluids, where you have two different kind of fluids, and then you mix them all together, and then you say, do it long enough, and then you have a homogeneous mixture. And I thought it's the same with, with colors, in fact. So these are different examples of patterns. They are homogeneous in terms of how they are spread across the whole, um, whole box, whole frame here. In contrast, if you say, take, for example, water and oil, you mix it, you will always have those two phases. That's called inhomogeneous. There's a sort of a gradient. On one side, you always find uh, um, brown colors, for example, and on the other side, more green colors. And finally, there's also this concept of um, heterogeneous um, color mixing, where independent where you are, you can never guess the color distribution on the other side. Okay, I know it's a bit theoretical, but the concept of homogeneous color mixture, inhomogeneous and heterogeneous mixture should be familiar, I think. So at this point, I still have no method actually how to, to convert things into numbers and then to describe or to compare those images. So I continue and I thought, okay, let's, let's take those examples here. Yeah? Let's have a look. What is striking? What kind of features can we extract? And then I thought, well, what about color distribution? If we look at this one here, one out of nine of these squares is brown. And if we sum it up in terms of area, it's the same for these two and the third one here. Versus this one here, four out of nine are green. So using color feature, extracting um, the color distribution from these images, we can separate those eight images into two lots. So essentially you have two classes, class A and class B, okay? And I thought, what else can we actually do? Well, how is this um, brown box here distributed uh, in, in this image here? What about if I split it into quarters and those quarters are scattered around in the, in the image? This is the concept of texture. Texture actually describes how um, color are mixed spatially within an image. And there's, there are various ways to, um, to analyze this, but one way is to um, to basically count the, the size of the contour, the circumference, um, sorry, the, the, the contour pixels here. So this one here, 
sums up to, let's say, four units. And these two here already sums up to four, but there are also two other brown boxes here. So there's a difference in texture, essentially. So meaning if I utilize not only color, but also texture information, I now have A, B, C, D, four different classes. So this seems to be leading to something now. So how about separating those two here? Well, I know the color distribution both are is the same. In terms of texture, it's also the same. But if I look at a specific location here, is it the same or not? And apparently it's not. So at, uh, let's call this here B2 as a position. This is brown. And on the other side, it's not. So looking, extracting regional information, I now can have this as a solution, A, B, C, D, four classes, and now with the addition of E, F, G, H. Three information I've extracted, color distribution, texture, and regional information. This spans a solution space which is three-dimensional. And it does have a benefit because now I have a matrix. I can now start to compare things because I can say, well, how different is this one from this one here? Imagine this is a unit um, box, which means it has a length of one. Then the distance or the dissimilarity between this and this is one, which is true because the difference is um, how colors are distributed regionally. And from here to there would also be one. Or the alternative, what is the difference between this and this? Can use this approach, one, two, or the Euclidean distance, which is square two. So essentially you have, I have, by extracting those three features, a method to compare things and come up with a metric. I can boil it down to two numbers, essentially. And what I did is I compare everything against everything and come up with this sort of cluster and all those distances are, are measured, and traditionally, what at least what I know from, from sequence analysis, is we build those dendrograms in order to, you know, aggregate things that are similar or s dissimilar. However, I don't find this very useful as a visualization tool to find clusters, and luckily I am, during my uh, postdoc time at the veterinary, veterinary medicine in Cambridge, I met Simon Frost, and he told me the concept of something called multidimensional scaling. Sounds sophisticated. But the key point is that it creates a scatter plot where the differences between the objects is preserved. Okay? It calculates new coordinates in a two-dimensional space, x and y, where the data points the relative distance between those data points reflects similarity or dissimilarity as we have seen before. And you might ask, what is X and Y? They are arbitrary units. Why? Take the whole data point as it is. Move it to the left or to the right, up or down, even rotate it. The relative distance between the points is not altered, and they describe how things are similar or dissimilar, okay? So this works for, for, for this example, for this image here. But it's the same as this one here. This one here has a similarity with this one, and this, and this, and therefore the distances, the relative distance here in this plot is shorter than the green ones here, and the blue being the maximum. So I know it's a long way to to, to explain this thing here, but essentially, from a set of images like this one here, I extracted three features, um, color distribution, texture, and regional information, in order to generate a plot like this, where the points represent the objects, the images, and the relative distance describes how dissimilar or how similar they are, okay? The closer they are, the more similar they are. The further distant they're away, uh, the further they're away, 
um, the, f the more distant they are. Okay. So I thought, great, now I got a recipe. I have an idea how to deal with these things. And in fact, it boils down to three things. The first thing is I need to transform the colors. That was this called dark green color index concept. The second is I need to extract the features. Again, color distribution, texture, and regional information. Once I've done all this, all I need to do is I need to cluster the data. The first two points uh, are done with the, with the Lambda Tag software using this um, visual programming approach, if you want. So it's, it's um, you generate an image processing by creating or defining an, a workflow. So in this workflow here, you have the color transformation concept reflected in this pipeline and you have the regional extraction feature extra, um, reflected in this pipeline here, and then the texture as well. So, so really, using the Lambda Grid or the Lambda Text software, the two first two points can be um, easily solved with this software. The data clustering is done in R and um, well, at least I have a strong affinity to R. I like to use it, and I, in fact, I like to use this kind of way of, of programming, but it doesn't always appeal to others. So here, the approach is to write lines of source code, and therefore, you need to know precisely the syntax, the grammar, the parameter that goes in uh, into the formula, into the function, different to, uh, to the Lambda Grid solution where it's more visual-based, and you can click drag and drop and you know, try things out. Nevertheless, I got my recipe, I got my tools, I got my data set, those uh, 40 images, and I get an output, and this is this plot. And you see that the right top corner here, all those dots aggregate at this point. So they must have some sort of similarity in their phenotype, in their you know, um, visual uh, um, property. And I did a manual inspection of, of these data points. And here's just some examples. And I see they are really green. And what about those lower ones? Well, they are different than the top ones. They are brown. And what about in, uh, in between? These are really the intermediate states. So this one here is green, but in the middle a bit more Mm, well, is the word chlorotic, right? But well, it, it's yellowish. And this one in more uh, um, more brownish state. This one was the example before where all this material here is dried out. Only the top left corner here is more the, the healthy uh, material. So I thought, well, this, this, um, this approach seems to work actually. But it's a bit tedious to manually inspect all those um, dots with images to see whether it works or not. And then I thought, well, this is a map rep uh, representing um, the similarity between those images. How about having a landmarks in the map? So that means essentially I use references. Okay, so I generated those reference images and I computed the similarity with the turf grass images and I utilized those as landmarks because if all these dots are in the region or in the proximity of this reference, then I know they must be green. And this one was, must be something you know, in between. So I use these landmarks to characterize uh, my result, essentially. Okay? So then on the last day, on the seventh day, on a biblical term point of view, Genesis, um, I went to Matthias and said, Matthias, I got, I got the result. And he said, what is it? I said, well, I got an idea. I was able to translate the idea into, into a solution by using Lambda Grid and also using R for data analysis. I said I, I was able to classify those turf grass samples with numericals. 
no longer, yeah, it looks like green, it look, doesn't look like green. I have it in numbers, and you can reproduce it. It's objective. And finally, I said, I think I have a workable solution to present, and it's a strategy for turf grass screening. And he said, well, well done. <laughs> so this is the story of how I tackle the turf grass project. And i like to finish this talk by mentioning that there are more projects out there. And as I said, I'm, I'm, um, I'm now working as an application scientist. And um, I'm looking forward to, to, um, to tackle other tasks like hyperspectral analysis, root analysis, um, the, the architecture of roots, height imaging, and 3D stuff. And finally, i like to say that if you find things that I've explained here interesting or you'd like to exchange ideas with me, then I'm, by all means, I'm, I'm here all day and I would love to talk with you and understand your, your work and um, how I can make a contribution to your uh, work, essentially. So thank you. <laughs>